Thanks, Troy. Uh, I'm sorry I lied about him being my grandfather. Uh, I didn't mean anything by it. Uh, I'm, uh, I really appreciate that, Troy, though, because I spent all last night trying to pray off pride and things like that, so it's nice of him to take the time to fill me back up with it. Um, uh, like you said, my name is Jesse Bays, and I have something called a stutter. And what that means is that uh, I'm going to start, and I'm going to stop, and you're going to see me make a lot of really dumb-looking faces. And that's OK. You can laugh. All the kids in junior high did. It's fine. It's fine. You can join them. That's a joke. You can laugh at that, too. <laughs> I was looking in the front row. They're like, oh. <laughs> no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Um, um, I'm going to invite you guys to do something today. I'm going to take a serious risk in the fact that you guys might fall asleep, and that's okay. I'm not going to be mad at you. If you do, I don't even know most of you, so it's not going to matter. You can fall asleep. Uh, I'm going to take a risk, and I'm going to ask you guys to imagine. Um, I want you to imagine yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, and a lot of times it's really hard for me, so I want you to focus, and I want you to fight for it. Um, and what that means is just pushing away all, all their choices and all of the distractions and anyone around you and just focus on putting yourself in this person's shoes. If the year is 8066. You are a child. And I want you to imagine your family for just a second. I want you to imagine your mother and your father and your brothers and sisters and you love them, right? You love them, and they love you, and you care about each other. And I want you to imagine that one night as you, as you were supposed to be asleep, you stayed awake and you listened to your mother and father talk about the new emperor. And I want you to imagine that his name is Emperor Nero, and he's an evil man, and he hates you. He hates Christians. He hates Christians, and your family is a family full of Christians. And I want you to imagine that you hear them talking about your neighbors and your friends being dragged out of their houses and dragged into, and dragged into this evil man's garden and set on fire for his friends' entertainment. I want you to imagine. And I want you to imagine that one night as you're eating dinner, and your father's praying, and he prays, God, please, please you protect me from the fires. Protect my family. I want you to imagine that your mother can't take anymore, and she breaks down and cries. I've seen my mother cry. It isn't good, right? I want you to imagine those tears. And I want you to imagine that as your mother's crying and as your dad's trying to comfort her, you hear a knock. I want you to imagine that knock and I want you to look into your father's eyes and I want you to see the panic in his eyes. And I want you to see the worry in his eyes and as any good father does, he hides you. And as any good father does, he hides you and he looks around for something big to hit somebody with, right? Right? He hides you. And you can hear yourself praying now, not by your own will, but you hear yourself praying, God, please save me. God, please save me from the flames. God, save my family. Save my sister. Save my brother from the fires. God, save us. And the door knocks again. And your dad takes one last look at you and he walks over to the door. And the door creaks open. And outside are 15 of your friends, 15 of your family. And they pour in. And this is your church. And they say, we have a letter with us, a letter from the Apostle Peter. We have a letter. And your dad starts to read it. And everyone thinks, man, man, Peter's going to tell us how to live, right? Man, Peter's going to tell us that Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the warrior of warriors, is going to come down, and he's going to fight off Nero's army for us. And your, and your father starts reading, and I want you to imagine that this is what you, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, your family, and your mother, this is what you hear him read. That tape's really sticky. 
Dear friends, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. I'm going to read that again. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Friends, doesn't that chill your bones? Right? Doesn't that chill your bones that Peter, he wrote these poor people a letter and he said, hey, look, the fire's coming. Right? The fire's coming. Don't, don't be surprised when it comes. Right? Don't be surprised when it comes and instead celebrate that it's coming. I don't know about you, but I'm a little surprised, right? And shouldn't I be a little, a little bit surprised that I have a father who is the creator of the world, that I have a father who brought dead men back to life, that I have a father who split the ocean. I should be a little surprised that he isn't going to save me, right? I should be a little surprised that he isn't going to save me from the fires. Have you ever, here we see Peter writing this church a letter, and here we see Peter writing us a letter, and he says, don't be surprised when the war comes, right? Don't be surprised when the divorce comes. Don't be surprised when the cancer comes. Don't be surprised when the affair comes. Don't be surprised when the heartache comes. Don't be surprised. <clears throat> Why? Why shouldn't I be surprised, right? But shouldn't I be surprised when I pray and I pray and I pray that, the, that my parents' marriage be saved and it isn't saved? Shouldn't I be shocked? Why does that happen? And, and the truth is, I'm going to be super honest with you, and there are a lot of super smart people in the world. I am not one of those, I'm not one of those people. Um, I, I, I have no idea. I have no idea why it happens, but we can't argue that it doesn't happen, right? I mean, no one can sit here and say, oh, I've never suffered, right? And if you can say that, maybe you should get up here and preach instead, right? <laughs> um, you should tell us all your secret, because I've suffered and I've seen suffering. Like Troy said, I've been to Thailand, and I've seen the Christians there just be persecuted and beat down by Buddhism, and I've seen them just be beat and beat and be and starve with faith in Jesus Christ. I've seen it. I've seen the starvation in the Dominican Republic. I've seen it. I've lived through divorce and I've lived through I've lived through affairs and I've I've seen it. I've seen it and it's real, right? And, and the question is why? Um, I'm going to pray real fast, and I hope you'll pray with me. God, please, Lord, speak to us. God, help me not take this casually. God, I don't want to waste this. Please, Father, open our hearts. Help us listen. Um, help me speak in your name, I pray. Amen. Um, I'm not sure why it happens, but we are promised that it will happen, right? And we're promised all over all over scripture, like it's in, it's in this entire book, right? Right? Right, we can agree with that. It is in this entire book. Um, <laughs> um, so now I'm going to ask you kind of a different question, but I promise it relates. Do you love your brother? You can answer. Do you love your brother? Do you love your brother enough to suffer for him? Do you love your brother enough to be vulnerable in front of him? Do you love your brother enough to let him see you suffer? Because Paul's got this really interesting idea here. And it's about suffering, and it comes from Philippians, and he says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you 
or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm, wanting of faith, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. And so right here Paul says, hey, hey, no matter what, I want you guys to link arms and I want you to huddle down and I want you to keep walking, right? And I want you to huddle down and I want you to keep walking when the fire comes and when the cancer comes and when all this crap comes, I want you to keep walking, right? And you're going to be hit and you're going to be hit and you're going to be hit and and you're going to ask why and Paul's going to tell you, um, He says, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. And and by that, by God. And so here Paul says that our walking, our walking through this mess as one, our sufferings, our tears, all of that, so others can look at us as a group, as a church, and they'll see, hey, they're saved. They're saved. How are they not afraid of cancer? How are they not afraid of divorce? How are they not afraid? And they're going to look at us and they're going to say, wow, they're saved. And they're going to say, I am not. And I love, I love, I love my unsaved friends, right? I love, I love, I love my unsaved family. But it is so hard for me to let them see my impurity, right? It's so hard for them to let me see my fear. But church, let me tell you something that the, what, the world's ne- what the world needs now is not to see our perfection and our purity. What the world needs is to watch us struggle, right? They need to watch us crawl tooth and nail next to our brother, next to our sister. They need to watch us struggle, and that's how they're going to be sure that they'll be destroyed and that we are saved, right? And to me right now, that's all that matters, right? Um, I have one last point. Um, And I'm going to ask you that question again. Do you love your brother? Do you love your brother? You can answer. Yeah. Do you love your brother enough to suffer for him? You can answer. It's okay to say no. <laughs> um, do you believe in this book? I'm holding the Bible. I just have note cards in it. Do you believe in it? All of it? <clears throat> God, please don't let them be mad at me. (laughs) Um. (laughs) This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has the material possessions and sees his brothers in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with our words or our tongues, but with our actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Do you love your brother? Yeah, yeah, right? I think there's a curse on the church, okay? I think we have tricked ourselves away from this, like, prosperity gospel, which I am glad for, but into something much, much worse called the mediocrity gospel, right? I think we have tricked ourselves and to believing that the full power of Jesus Christ does not exist inside of us, I think we have tricked ourselves into believing that we cannot change the world, right? That the power and the spirit of Jesus Christ has no power in this world. I think we have tricked ourselves, right? And what cowards we are, 
right? What cowards we are. What kind of coward am I that I can allow myself to drive through a McDonald's drive through and eat well more than I can eat and, and drive right past homeless people, right? What kind of coward am I, right? What kind of coward am I that I can spend my life trying to make money and try to build houses and there are children dying, right? What kind of coward am I? I've seen them. I've seen the children, right? I've seen them die. I've seen them be sl I've seen them be sold into slavery. Slavery's still real, and it's here, right? It's here, and we're hiding it, and we're hiding behind it because we're cowards, right? I can't exist in that kind of world anymore. I can't. I'm, I'll confess I'm not a preacher. I never will be. Sorry, you shouldn't have let me here. <laughs> I can't exist in that kind of world anymore. You, you guys, you preachers, you the voices of our generation, you shouldn't exist in that kind of world anymore. You shouldn't allow your congregations to exist in a world where there are children dying over here and we're eating potlucks on Sunday, right? You shouldn't allow your children to exist anymore where there are six-year-olds being sold for the pleasure of older men and you're buying your children iPods for Christmas, right? You shouldn't exist in that kind of world. And I don't think, and I hear a lot of excuses like, oh, well, Jesus said the poor will always be with us. Right? He said the poor will always be with us. Yeah, because that's what he meant. He meant the poor will always be with us, so we shouldn't help them. Right? I'm sure that's exactly what he meant. I'm sure you can find a way to justify whatever you want to do in here. I don't agree with you. I don't. I don't. And I'm not one for confrontation. I'm not one for speaking. But there are lives on the line. Right? There are children's lives on the line and we're wasting them. We're wasting them and we're justifying our actions with this. With my God's holy and precious words, we're justifying our actions and how dare us. Right? How dare us. I'm sorry I got so mean. <laughs> um, I'm going to pray. Is that okay? Father God, you are good. Um, and I trust you, God, and I love you. Um, please, Lord, Father, um, just keep speaking to us, God. And teach us, God, and break our heart for your gospel and break our heart for your word. Um, in your name I pray. Amen.